Greetings, everyone. I'm Dee Kumar, uh, Vice President of Developer Marketing for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. First, I want to say I'm so thrilled to be back in Bangalore. I live in San Francisco, California, but I grew up here, so this is my town. So I'm going to uh, say something in Canada just to refresh my uh, childhood memories. So, hello, Rigu. Namaskara. So I head up uh, developer marketing at CNCF. So I'm a marketer uh, by trade, but very much an engineer uh, at the core. So I love working with developers around the globe, uh, building local communities in the cloud native ecosystem. So if you Google digital transformation, believe it or not, uh, you will end up with approximately 300 million plus search results. And yet, I'm unable to find a good definition for digital transformation. But as a part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, we work very closely with analysts, and we also observe the industry. And based on industry reports and everything that we are hearing, there are four major factors or phenomena that are driving this change. So more buzzwords here again, but I'll do my best to get into the specifics. Uh, so the four main factors are economic ecosystems, democratization, acceleration, and collaboration. So let's start with democratization. Why do companies open source projects? So using Google as an example, and Kubernetes, which is the leading orchestration platform, was a Google-led project. Industry leaders like Craig McClukey and many others, they came together to solve some major problems in the industry. How do we accelerate cloud native computing, whether it's DevOps, microservices, orchestration, containers. How do we create a portability layer for the cloud? And lastly, how do we achieve digital transformation? Where do we begin? Google has been using containers internally for many years, but Google alone is not able to change the broad perspective in the industry around modern applications. So there is a need for industry leaders and influencers to come together to solve the major problems that I just talked about. And the beauty of these industry leaders is they represent the collective views of all of us developers across various companies, IT practitioners, and they also represent real world end user customer use cases. And what that means is it really helps to drive that broader change in terms of how we think and think about modern applications, whether it's hybrid cloud or moving portable units to the cloud, no vendor lock-in, et cetera. So in order to achieve this broader impact, Google donated Kubernetes to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So this led to the birth of CNCF in 2015. And Kubernetes became the anchor tenant for CNCF. CNCF was founded with 28 members. And today, as uh, Dan Kahn mentioned in his opening remarks, we, are, we have 375 plus members and growing. Uh, we are the home to 34 cloud native uh, projects and technologies. We have 83 Kubernetes certified providers, including some of the largest public cloud providers, as well as large enterprise software companies. As you can see from this chart here, the adoption of Kubernetes continues to move to the right. I just pulled out some recent stats for you all today. So Kubernetes has over 100,000 commits, over 25,000 developers, 85,000 pull requests, and thanks to Nikita who pointed out to me that uh, Kubernetes has about 49,930 stars on GitHub. And compared to, I would say, 1.5 million open source projects on GitHub, Kubernetes ranks number nine for commits, number two for authors or issues, second only to Linux. And last year, Kubernetes was the first CNCF project to graduate, followed by Prometheus and Envoy. And again, this year, we have two, another, two other projects that graduated, which is CodeDNS and ContainerD. The other thing that we're observing from a contribution standpoint, less than 50% of the contributions are coming from the US. So it's more from the rest of the world, like India and China. 
Now let's talk about collaboration. Why do, how do companies maintain control when all these projects are community driven? So for that, we first need to understand who makes up our community. So the community is comprised of developers, contributors, maintainers, program managers, product managers, community leaders, and they are the heart and soul of the cloud native ecosystem. And Sarah Novotny is a good friend of mine. Uh, she's the head of open source at Google, and she always says, let's see folks take more pride in chopping wood and carrying water. And what that means is there are a lot of I would say non-sexy tasks that need to happen. And that's why the community, regardless of the companies you work for, we collectively make things happen. And that's the meaning of let's take more pride in chopping wood and carrying water. The other thing I wanted to point out about the open source community is the community again demonstrates a culture of very strong core uh, values. And it's the result of the community's hard work that's led to the rise of Kubernetes massive adoption in production. It established organizations like uh, Uber, Lyft, uh, BlackRock, Bloomberg, uh, eBay, New York Times. All of them are now using Kubernetes in production at a massive scale. We work very closely with Redmonk and according to a recent survey from Redmonk, 70% of Fortune 100 companies are using containers, and more than 50% of Fortune 100 companies are using Kubernetes as their orchestration platform. The other thing I always get asked is, is the open source community like a standards body? And again, Sarah Novotny put this into perspective for me. So in the 1990s, the standards body, they first started out with a spec, and then it was followed by implementation, which is programming, coding, which then led to all the processes and governance around that. But the open source community approach is more like better. So you start with code first, and, that, and then you collate that into a spec, which then becomes a standard. Again, as Dan Kahn mentioned, uh, we are very grateful and thankful that our end user community is growing. We have 79 companies in our end user community. Also want to take the time to define what do we mean by end users. So end users are essentially really great brand companies where they are using and trying cloud native technologies internally and they're not commercializing or selling uh, cloud native technologies externally. And so we work very closely with the end user community and it's really important because they are like the early adopters and they're taking big risks with trying out all the open source projects. And what we do is we make sure we gather their feedback, their requirements, and which in turn is helping shape all the cloud native projects hosted under CNCF and making these projects more reliable. Now I also want to touch upon, there are not some always, not all open source projects are successful. Uh, successful. So I want to share a little story about this company called Cluster HQ. So a few years ago, Cluster HQ took about $18 million in uh, venture capital funding, and then the company shut down. And then there was a blog post from the CEO which read, we are cluster mom. So what went wrong? So the Customers of Cluster HQ were definitely not wrong. So there is a strong need for the uh, infrastructure software to support stateful containers. So Flocker was an open source project from Cluster HQ, but the issue was Flocker was connecting to a wrong storage. So what I mean by that is it was connecting to legacy storage architecture. So essentially, storage arrays that were meant to serve storage for servers and not for applications running in containers. So though Cluster HQ set the path for the industry to think about infrastructure software to support stateful containers, where Cluster HQ went wrong is they came to market pretty early and then also at that point in time, the legacy storage architectures were still evolving. And today, if you, lose, if you see, the legacy storage architectures have evolved a lot, uh, thereby supporting stateful containers. It's also really important, and again, I think Dan touched upon this slide uh, in his opening remarks, is we need to understand what do we mean by crossing the chasm. 
So there is a book by Jeffrey Moore where he talks about five segments of technology consumers. So the first segment is innovators. These are techies who live on the bleeding edge and they love to play with new technologies and make these new technologies work. And then you have the early adopters who are essentially visionaries and what they do is they try to take the work from the innovators and push it through large organizations and they actually take the risk to use these technologies, new technologies against highly visible, high risk uh, projects. And then you have the early uh, majority who are pragmatists and all they care about is to improve productivity with existing operations. And hence lies the chasm. So the first two segments, they want, to, they want change and disruption. And the early majority of the pragmatists, they're just looking for continuity. And it's not coincidentally that the stages of projects within CNCF neatly map to the segments. So we have three stages for our CNCF projects, which is sandbox, incubation, and graduation. And then there is one third of the end users who are the late majority and they just want things to work. They don't want to spend a lot of time and invest a lot of time and deep expertise. And offering a managed service like Kubernetes could really help them with ease of setup as well as to reduce operational complexity. So as technology becomes more and more reliable that allows for the late majority to adopt, that again allows for the influx of new wave of sandbox, sandbox projects, thereby resulting in more innovation. The next thing I want to talk about is economic ecosystems. Uh, really want to thank all the members, uh, AWS, Microsoft, a number of platinum members here, who are really committed to open source and the cause of open source, as well as the community that is growing uh, around it. Also want to thank our some of our gold members, all of our gold members, uh, JFrog, DigitalOcean, etc., for really again uh, being a part of this community and believing in the cause of open source. And again, it's because of the support that we're getting from these members, it is resulting in flourishing ecosystems. So thanks to Dan Kahn, who's the creator of the landscape. Um, and then the excitement is actually seen in the CNCF landscape, where as we have all these members who are coming in and becoming a part of the foundation, as you can see here, there is a challenge. The logos are becoming really, really small. But I think it's a great problem for us to have. Um, and what that is, what that is representat uh, representative is there is a lot of, there is an increased adoption of cloud native uh, projects or technologies. Uh, so Kubernetes has developed and grown to becoming an economic powerhouse, thereby allowing number of projects to be built around it. And what is, that has done is it's resulted in opportunities for companies of any size to start creating products and services, and thereby that, again, results in a cycle of flourishing economic ecosystems. I love this slide. This is from uh, Jim Zemlin, who's our executive director for the Linux Foundation. And he really thinks about how do we sustain this innovation? So you have the projects, and then those projects are being used to create products, and then everyone, end of the day, thinks about profits. Uh, so the way uh, we want to think about it is our jobs here collectively is to make sure that these three gears are really spinning faster. And our job in CNCF is to make sure that we host really good open source projects so all of you and all the different companies you're a part of can use the open source projects and then you build products and services on top of it so you can commercialize it, thereby resulting in value, which is profits. And then the beauty of this whole cycle is you then take the profits and you reinvest it back into the open source projects. And what that means is you hire more engineers, developers, means more code, more improvements, and thereby resulting in more products and services. And then it just becomes a virtuous cycle of uh, investment, innovation, and economic uh, activity. I guess you all have heard from all the talks uh, since morning. 
the path to cloud native can be pretty daunting. Um, and so one of the things uh, we have done as in, in CNCF is we've created this tool, which is the cloud native uh, trail map. And essentially, this is a, I would say, a get started guide. It can be more like a pocket guide if you're just thinking about digital transformation, where do I begin? Again, it's not like in a specific order. Uh, there are innumerable paths to get on this journey. It can be very specific to a different use case. You can perhaps have step one and jump to another set of steps in the trail map. So the way we came up with the trail map is to kind of think about when you're going on a hike, uh, you essentially have a map, and then there are different trails to pursue. Um, so we use that as an analogy to kind of simplify this whole journey to cloud native. And also, having talked to the end user community, uh, I can say that this path is kind of more uh, well-traveled, well-tested, and well-trusted. So there are like 10 steps that we define as a part of the cloud native trail map. Uh, so I quickly want to go through the 10 steps. So the step one is containerization. So you can do cloud native unless you containerize your application. So it doesn't matter what size of application is, any size application will do. And even if you have a PDP 11 old code running in an emulator, you can still containerize that. Uh, Ticketmaster is a good example where they did have PDP 11 code running and then they were very successful in containerizing uh, their application. The second step is often there's some confusion where once you containerize, people immediately think that you need to orchestrate it. Uh, but then there is a set of processes. You do need to set up continuous integration and continuous delivery. So the changes that you make to your source code results in containers that are automatically built, uh, tested, and deployed across various environments, whether it's uh, uh, staging, uh, moving to QA, and uh, to production. The next thing you want to think about is to set up uh, automated rollouts, uh, rollbacks, as well as testing. Uh, CNCF, we don't offer a CI-CD solution, um, but there are some solutions to think about, which is Jenkins, uh, JFrog, and Spinnaker. We did announce a new foundation called the CDF at the Leadership Summit a couple of weeks ago, uh, where we are primarily going to be focused on uh, the CICD lifecycle and the projects and ecosystem around that. Step three is orchestration. So pick an orchestration solution. Uh, Kubernetes is definitely the leading orchestration platform. There's a certified version that's available, but you can also think of other orchestration options that are available, which is Docker Swarm, uh, Mesos, Pouch, Nomad, etc. Step four is observability. Observability is essentially table stakes for cloud native at scale. So you want to then think about monitoring, logging, as well as tracing. Uh, for monitoring, you can consider Prometheus. For logging, Fluent D. And for tracing, you want to look for an open tracing compliance solution like Jaeger. Step five is service mesh. I think we all know service mesh by its name says that it's all about connecting services, discovery of services, uh, health check checking, routing, and it's to use for monitoring ingress from the uh, internet. Some of the solutions to consider here are Envoy, Linkerd, and CoreDNS. Step six is networking. So it's really important to enable a more flexible uh, networking layer. So it's important to uh, look at a CNI compliant network project like Calico, uh, WeaveNet, or Flannel. Distributed database, again, if you're looking for more resiliency and scalability, you will not get that with a single uh, database. So you want to look at Vitus, which is a distributed database. And it's really a good option for running uh, MySQL at uh, scale through sharding. Step eight uh, is messaging. So again, here, when you're looking for higher performance than JSON REST, uh, gRPC is a good solution to look at. NATS is a messaging system. Again, it's more middleware oriented. It has a publish and a subscribe kind of messaging uh, system. And it also is applicable and takes care of many newer uh, use cases like IoT. 
container runtime, uh, you can use alternative container runtimes. Uh, I think it's important to look at an OCI compliant version like ContainerD, Rocket, or CRIO. Alibaba's Pouch container runtime is also a good option. The last step is software distribution. Again, if you need to do a secure software distribution, you might want to evaluate Nodary, uh, which is based on the update framework, which is called Tough. Uh, so Tough, again, is defined for a really large part of a large uh, software distribution framework. And the beauty of Tough is it's very secure. And the way it does that is it incorporates cryptographic keys uh, which again has different kinds of keys for content verification, uh, content signing. And then uh, the tough framework is designed to more or less address a lot of the different uh, use cases in terms of security uh, attacks. And uh, tough is being used in production by Docker, uh, VMware, uh, Leap, and other companies that, that are listed here. Harbor is, again, a secure container registry, and now it's a part of uh, a CNCF project. So the last uh, factor I want to talk about is acceleration. So this is really good news. Uh, we, again, in CNCF, we do a survey uh, each year. We do it three times uh, in English as well as in Chinese. As you can see, some amazing results here. Uh, based on the survey results, when we talk to enterprise companies where we really focus on developers and IT practitioners, uh, we are seeing that cloud-native technologies in production has grown over 200%. And some of the main benefits that folks are seeing in the cloud native ecosystem is primarily around faster deployment time, improved scalability, and of course, cloud uh, portability. Lastly, I wanted to just uh, share a little story from Pinterest. Uh, most of us have heard of Pinterest. They've been in existence for, uh, I would say, eight years now. And they've grown so fast. Uh, so that has resulted in about thousands of microservices and a lot of infrastructure layers that are old. Uh, so Pinterest uh, went on a mission in terms of wanting to launch a new compute platform very quickly from idea to production. So they went about doing that by putting all the thousand microservices inside of Docker. And once they did that as a part of phase two, they started evaluating orchestration solutions. And then they settled on uh, Kubernetes. And one of the use cases they kind of you wanted to uh, use is to make sure that uh, the Jenkins workloads, uh, which is essentially serving the Pinterest website, it was a static uh, cluster, but then they moved that to the Kubernetes environment. And what they saw was some amazing results that I wanted to touch on is they saw uh, they were able to reclaim 80% um, of the capacity during non-peak hours. And then they also saw a reduction in 30% in terms of the uh, instant, uh, instant hours per day per use uh, in terms of serving content for the website. And again, uh, we focus on our end user community, and we have some amazing case studies. So feel free to go to our website, cncf.io, uh, where you can get a lot of uh, great stories in terms of how end users are trying and experimenting and using uh, cloud native technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Dave.